So all five of them are folks I've known uh, some recently I've met, but uh, I genuinely feel that they represent, in a sense, uh, a sort of a, <clears throat> a kind of a case in point check of where a good architecture in this country stands. Uh, many of us here in this audience are trained architects. Uh, many of us look, when we receive our training and our education, we look for cues from the so-called masters. And undeniably, Kabuzier is recognized as a master. So Kabuzier's journey to India, uh, one can't say how much it impacted him, but one can safely say that when he made his way here about 70 odd years ago, uh, his mark on Indian architecture has been almost indelible. One of the things Kabuzier did uh, to architecture right from when he began as a theorist in the 1920s was to kind of confront architecture uh, as it was practiced uh, before that. And how he did that was to actually talk about architecture in very simple languages, in very simple language, uh, but to kind of communicate really complex ideas with simple language. Uh, so today's panel, Confronting Kabuzier's Five Points, actually refers to uh, one of the kind of uh, lists that Kabuzier made that became almost Bible-like for architectural practitioners around the world, which were his uh, five points of modern architecture. Um, of course, I'm not going to pronounce the French. I couldn't possibly. But to kind of translate it, the five points of a new architecture is what Kabuzier framed in 1927. And if you read the French and can imagine the translation, it's the five points of, a, of an architecture, of a new architecture, as a consequence for modern techniques. So in the 1920s, there was a lot of coming together of, uh, there was a lot of uh, improvement in structural de design techniques and structural materials. And what was one of the fundamental things that Kabuzier felt shackled free new architecture was the fact that load transfer, the transfer of structural load from floor to floor is what shackled architecture. And he felt that the new techniques of modern architecture in the 1920s uh, was going to liberate architecture in various many ways. So he framed these five points. And these five points are, number one, stilts. Uh, so he spoke of the fact that now engineering existed so that the entire building could be elevated off the ground, almost to a monumental level, without having any connection to the ground, uh, in a sense freeing up the ground territory. The second was the free plan. And that meant that architects now needn't design their buildings and their rooms based on uh, standard load-bearing spans. They could now explore spaces that were very, very large, very, very small, spaces within spaces. So it kind of freed up the plan. Similarly, because of these new techniques in the 1920, uh, 1920s, you could free up your facade. So windows were no longer arched, did not have an imperative of load transfer spans that existed earlier. Fourth point was horizontal windows. Now, Kabuzier felt that one of the important things architecture must contribute to is what he called pure living. And very inherent to his idea of pure living was this idea of having clean, clear views. So in most of his buildings, you see this emphasis on what the surroundings of the building looks like from these windows. And as a, as a kind of cue for how one can achieve that, he called them this, well, the French really means the window band but we translate to horizontal windows. So the idea that the light and ventilation that entered the building and the views that were framed by the window were no longer captured into a small window that were basically restricted in its size because of the imperatives of load transfer from the top. And finally, roof terrace. Now that, that actually, one, you know, uh, uh, almost 100 years after he's written these five points, one doesn't realize that before that, the idea that you have a flat roof that you could access and use was very, very alien, especially in Europe. Most of the roofs were sloping. So these were his five points. And now these ideas, these five points, have taken a huge journey. They've, they've taken a journey through space and time. These five points have traveled around the world. And they've now traveled around the world for almost a century. So like I said, these five points in Kabuzia's mind stood for five completely liberating ideas for architecture. Freeing the ground, freeing the plan, freeing the facade, freeing light and views, and creating socially activated roofs. Here in India, 
perhaps because we like to have kunjis and lists and we like to be told how to do things, there's been a dumbing down of these, the potential of these five ideas. And not just in India, I'd say all over the world, but this is where, uh, you know, it's always important for architects to keep thinking about why something, why any thoughts in architecture began. Uh, and so you see the result of what has happened to these five points. So the stilts have become stilt parking. We're all familiar with that. It's now part of all our master plans and bylaws. Uh, the free plan has become a collection of rooms, the BHK apartment. So the free plan doesn't actually open up the plan. It actually becomes a place where rooms get collected. The free facade has become, of course, there's some influence of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe also in this, but the free facade now has essentially become wafer thin and it's all about curtain walling. So uh, the strip windows have become service windows. The idea that you can have continuous bands of windows has increased the potential of uh, using more and more spaces internally for equipment and so on and so forth. And of course, the roof, as we are all familiar, first became the site for air conditioning devices, air conditioners, and now is slowly being taken up by solar roofs. So to confront Kabuzia's five, I have invited my five friends. Uh, I think I would like to call these the five points of a new Indian architecture. So we'll start uh, with Biju. Uh, he represents Architecture Red from Chennai. Uh, so Biju, if you would come and present. Thank you. He represents Architecture Red from Chennai. Uh, so Biju, if you would come and present. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Foyd, for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Uh, I just want to start by saying I'm not a theoretician. I'm a hardcore practitioner uh, who would like to look at practice as a way to uh, see what the world is and what new theoretical frameworks that can come from uh, the practice that we do. And hence, a lot of our work is driven by that kind of a thinking. And we like to look at architecture as a way to see the world and uh, understand the world and, and take back what, whatever we learn from through the practice into the sort of the theoretical frameworks that we can generate. Um, Okay, uh, I'll start with Venturi. Venturi once said that, uh, you know, looking at Mies' work, Venturi once said, Mies could do these beautiful, elegant buildings because he chose to ignore the many complexities that came with the project and the context within which he practiced. Um, we, in many ways, have a love-hate relationship with uh, this modernist approach. When I say we, we as a practice uh, and the people who are involved with the practice, uh, primarily for the reasons that Venturi actually outlined. We love it because uh, it, it creates, most of it created beautiful, elegant buildings. We also hate it because it chose to ignore many of the complexities that came with the project or the context within which it practiced. Uh, Villa Savoy, for me, uh, represents in many ways uh, these two views of modernist approach. It's an important theoretical project that investigates an architecture style free of decoration, of historical ties, and one that articulates the functionality of a building in its pure form. However, uh, critically looking at it, it, it really is the celebration of the object and the composition of various components independently while lacking the definition of spatial relationship to one another. So the conception of Pilates, which I'm going to talk about, offers structural freedom, a free open plan, a free facade. However, in its articulation and function, Pilates represent a very specific attitude towards the ground. Although Kabuzier talked about the ground being the collective space, when you actually study the plan, we actually study the way he kind of uh, executed it, it many ways actually announces that the ground belongs to the automobile uh, with very little relationship to, the, to what's happening above, uh, not to the context that it is set in. It, is, it, it was really about kind of the monumentality of that object. And this fractured relationship of the ground one can see all across our buildings the way we do today. Uh, when we look at, and, and it is also supported by the way our building regulations, et cetera, et cetera, are written, and it supports the practice of taking the most limited and most valuable resource in our context, which is the ground or the land, and giving it to cars and parking as opposed to people and communities to come together. 
So many of our investigations within, this, within our practice is about critically looking at it this, and where we look at architecture as really the choreography of life and not a machine for living. So when we started working, uh, um, when we started working uh, in a university campus in Chennai, uh, we started, you know, we looked at many of these thoughts that we had, and it's not just about the ground, but it's also kind of how one go from a horizontal campus to a vertical campus. This is an architecture school which we recently completed, where we lifted up the ground, the building to kind of allow the the campus to come into the into the architecture school, and so the ground then becomes an activated public space where both the both the both the discipline and the larger campus kind of start to intersect. But it's also and then it start to create this. Um, uh, of course, the structural system is free of the facade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It also creates this large open plan which Kabuzi had talked about. But we also wanted to kind of. Uh, create a sort of a uh, uh, bring in more character to that space, more to the to the individual space. We we were more interested in creating this relationship between many of these flows, many of these programs, and to the ground. We were in fact negotiating that relationship between the figure and the ground, where each of these floor plates eventually gets broken up to kind of create a courtyard, which then eventually creates a place and different identities. So each of them creates different identities, and then the whole thing becomes a place for memories, culture, character, et cetera, et cetera, the coming together of the people. And that's kind of we articulated the uh, instead of a horizontal facade, we uh, stripped windows, we looked at more of a punch vertical windows, which again responding to the climate, et cetera, et cetera. And then these are the diagrams of each of the floor plans, where you see that every floor has a courtyard, which then relates to the next one, and which then relates to the next one. And in totality, it starts to create a sort of a diagonal um, sectional courtyard, which goes up as, and, and making a strong relationship to the ground and to the larger campus as such. And that's the ground which is largely left as a public space for interaction and students, and not just within the architecture school, but also to the larger campus to kind of come together. And that's the section where that relationship is go, uh, you know, each of these floor plans are broken down to kind of create a courtyard within each of the floor. And then the, the building itself stitches itself back to the campus. And then, of course, many of these spaces are created, et cetera, et cetera. And it starts to kind of create that relationship to that context. Uh, where you, even if you are on the seventh floor, you feel that you are on the ground floor because we are strongly creating that, uh, that relationship. This is another building we completed in the same campus where you can see that negotiation between the figure and the ground and how we articulated that section in a way that the ground kind of becomes, uh, the, uh, you know, comes into the campus, comes into that particular building. Thereby, one start to kind of create that multiple identities and multiple uh, uh, sort of create a sense of place. This is a housing project which we are just completing in uh, in Trivandrum, where it's a very high density uh, development. The site is surrounded by 14 and 15 story buildings. When we went to the site, we actually real realized that it's an urban void, and how we knew that if you start to kind of build the traditional way, we, we are only kind of contributing to that uh, to that urban uh, density that already exists. And hence, we, uh, we started organizing the density from the top in a way that once we reached the third and the fourth floor, we got all the density that is required to be built on, this, uh, on the site, thereby leaving the entire site as a park. And, and also taking the parking uh, below grade. So it's in contrary to what, uh, you know, in, in what you see in Villa Sova, where the ground is taken over by the automobile. Here the idea is to kind of leave the entire ground as a park, where the unit starts only at the third and the fourth floor, uh, but the entire parking is kind of hidden below grade, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the site becomes an extension of the street, and it becomes almost like a community veranda, uh, you know, where one can enjoy and kind of the rains, et cetera, et cetera, and start to kind of relate to that content. Although each of these units are also designed in a way that they stop at different levels, so they start to overlook in a way that it starts to make that relationship to that ground. And then, of course, as you know, uh, one of the things that I often talk about is that the land is fixed. Indi India has a very unique characteristic. We have 2% of global land and 18% of world's population. We feel that we, are, we have an unfair share of land, and hence negotiating density becomes a critical component of, of our discussion on sustainability. And wherever we look to do, we look to kind of maximize that ground, and that's the sections. And then almost kind of create a reverse skyline to kind of so the, then the site, entire site then becomes a community space where people come together and kind of engage. The building is almost, the structure is almost complete. This is that space that where you kind of see that 
uh, three and four story void, urban void, which is almost like the ground is within the figure. And it also kind of opens up vistas and kind of engage with the, with the, with the site outside. Thank you. House and other ideas. Thank you. So, before we start, I have a confession. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't study the five points in college. So, when Madhavji approached to me about uh, Corpus Year's five Madhav. points, I was not at all aware of it. And then Madhavji actually took the pain to teach me, like a student, about the five points. And he actually made the relation, correlation between Pirouette House and how it was kind of different from the five points. And uh, the free plan is where I am trying to see where we differ from this typical idea of columns and plans being separate. So in this particular project, so we went to internet and search about everything of those five points, <laughs> studied it again. And then, you know, my boys actually put this presentation where, you know, like we took two, three pictures. So the plot in this particular scenario was a flooding plain and the soil's end capacity was less. So generally we are people who build load bearing structures. We don't go much for this column beam structures. But in this particular scenario, I had to go for, because it was a flooding plain. So, as the site was very restricted, I had to go for something like a, like the red dots typically show how the columns are. And uh, I wanted to give a central courtyard. So the central courtyard, uh, how the idea became is that the central courtyard had to become a bit more bigger because it was too constricted for me. Uh, I am more concerned about the courtyards rather than the spaces in some scenario because you need breathing space, you need light. And you can imagine how uh, the urban clutter can you know, can make your house devoid of light. So courtyard was something I really wanted to do, expand. As you can see in the diamond shape. So the square shape, I wanted it to change into the diamond shape. This was my design. So in some sense, my walls had to project like a flower kind of idea. You know, they had to project sideways. And we have been working with masonry for years. So I thought this was a good chance for my workers and all of us to do this particular idea and get a bigger courtyard, you know, even though the volume starts very small. So that is where this particular thing came of interest to us. Our columns, instead of freeing our plan, were actually uh, creating problems. We needed the columns also to bend. So that is where we realized that the columns are never devoid of the, uh, the plan, you know. If you want to do that, uh, it is possible, but if you want to do that, then your columns and beams have to be a very big span, which of course a, a, a normal Indian family cannot afford to give. They can afford to make columns, but definitely not of the size where I am doing, the plan is entirely devoid of it. So we had to strategize where uh, the column actually goes along with the walls. Uh, so instead of the... Uh, uh, so, along with the column, a bit of load-bearing capacity on the rat trap wall. So, this, we designed it in a rat trap fashion with fired bricks so that the load is taken. So, this was how basically we devised up the rat trap so that we can conceal these columns and uh, electrical plumbing conduits. But the bigger uh, problem for us was these walls were staggering. They were supposed to stagger. They were supposed to keep moving horizontally. So, instead of the column standing still, they had to come with us, with the walls, to support. So you can see here, these are few pictures of the rat trap being done. You can see the column actually doing and slowly the columns are also coming along with the walls. And this was the final product that we had. So this house was called a pirouette house because the central courtyard, uh, because it was like a flowing dress and uh, you know, we, I was very fascinated by Edgar Degas Blue Dancers, uh, who was an impressionist painter. And uh, the way the pirouette, dancer, the pirouette dance actually allows the walls to, you know, 
kind of go in a flowy way. So we were very fascinated by that. So that is why the name Pirouette House came. But as you can see, because my walls literally, uh, you know, uh, how to say, you know, like flowered outside, we could get this kind of light. So the entire structures were actually, uh, when you talk about, you know, like the columns can literally keep the walls divided, I, I don't think that is much possible when you are working with a, with a, you know, like a, within a structure which, where the columns have to really support. You can't give much of heavy columns. So as you can see, again, uh, the plan literally had to take the columns along with it. And you get spaces like this. So then we, as per Madhavji, we then went to analyze, you know, <laughs> how, you know, how are we different from this particular idea. So we saw that many of the ideas of Corbusier is actually quite frequently implemented. But the fact is that people always follow the columns. They do not take it out of the columns. It's very rare that people do that because you need highly skilled masons uh, and all those things to do that. But it is very easy for them to follow the columns. So the very fact which you say that the columns will make your design devoid of it, uh, I think it is possible. Maximum things which we see in recent times are things like that, you know, maybe a curve here and there. But you never see something which is going really out of the columns. If you want to do a structure like that, devoid of, you know, like any connection between columns and, uh, and the walls, it's a very difficult thing. So now we come to the next question. Uh, so if Corbusier said that uh, columns and beams uh, will free your space, did he mean that load-bearing spaces cannot be flexible. So that is the next thing, isn't it? If, if he said that you should use a lot of columns and beams to make your space more free, uh, that would also mean that he meant that load-bearing spaces are a bit more structured and it cannot be free. So let us see, this is another house which we did very recently. It's called Ledge House. So in this particular case, it is a, it is a house literally hanging on the side of a cliff. But we went for the load-bearing walls only. We didn't go for columns or beams. Uh, there were few columns in the isolated positions, but generally the building is a load bearing. So we had these tough walls which were made with a, a technique which we call shattered debris walls. And the idea was to have something like a ledge on the, on the edge of the cliff, you know. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to uh, enjoy uh, that titanic feeling, you know, like to go to the edge of the cliff and, you know, like have that great, wonderful feeling, that dreamy sequence. So we were thinking about how to give that uh, without, you know, like completely a column beam supported structure because we are very much using the local materials. As you can imagine, some of the soil which was taken was again reused for our wall structures. Uh, so this is Casuarina ferro cement roof technique which we are doing. And you can see that our uh, mud wall. So when we excavated the, the excavated for the building, we found a lot of loose stones in that particular area. So we merged that with our stabilized mud walls to form something like uh, you know, like a, a beautiful courtyard and, and and something which is you know like having a, a load bearing structure which would support Casuarina and ferro cement roof. So load-bearing structures can be really wide, you know. It's not that load-bearing structures will, you know, because this is the modern era. You can definitely keep some upturned beams and stuff like that and, and you can change the load-bearing capacity. So as you can see, uh, all the walls are basically made of these, uh, those mud walls, even the, uh, the entire walls are actually made with these mud kind of walls. And wherever we found openings, we gave glass and because it is a cold region, uh, you need to protect against the elements. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Ford. Thank you, Madhav, uh, for having me here. Um, and uh, some riveting presentations uh, before this one. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a story, and I'm pretty sure none of you know anything about this story. It's about Corbusier, 
And maybe the reason for that is I made it up. That was supposed to be an icebreaker. It didn't work. It's too but cold, this, Smaran, too cold. This one did, this one did. Um, so, Kurbuzier, exactly 100 years ago, on the 3rd of December, 2021, 20, uh, <laughs> I made it up. So I made it up now while sitting here. You know, um, went on a safari. And when he went on this safari, this is what happened. So Corbusier was scarred by this incident, not because the Pope held his hand, but because he didn't get the window. And every time the Pope came to the window, it would really bother Corbusier. But you know, he had an extremely analytical mind. And so the more he saw this, he started making this connection between architecture and the window, and the fact that the Pope was there. And so when he started diagramming this, now this is not made up, these are his sketches. He made this diagram for classicism, which is about the portrait window. And then he realized that the portrait window sort of celebrates the individual. You know, it has, it is about the portrait window, it's about the individual. So classical architecture where skin and structure come together by just the very nature of it has perforations that happen vertically that celebrate the individual. And for him, modernism was really about how he could kind of tackle this ideology and how he could make a more democratic space. And hence, he came up with the idea of the horizontal window, which is about the collective. So basically, you liberate the skin from the structure, and then you can cut it open, and then you have something for the collective. And that's what comes through in the Villa Sava, where you see the horizontal strip window in all its glory. And then Corbusier had his last laugh with the Pope. But something curious also happens with this ribbon window on the inside. What it does on the inside is that it captures the perfect view of the outside. So in a sense, it's actually picturesque. And hence, it's called the picture window. And this picture window for Corbusier was, was a very painterly way of looking at architecture and the idea of the facade and the idea of an opening, almost like a painting in a gallery. And what happened back in the 20s, when most of the international style homes were built, they were built in idyllic conditions, where you really had to capture the, the idyllic setting. But what happens when something like this needs to exist in a tight urban fabric? An urban fabric where we, were in, where, where we were asked to do a home, you know, in Bangalore on a tight 2,400 square foot plot, we were supposed to do a home. So then what really ha happens to this idea of the outside? The outside, unfortunately, in the kind of urban scenarios that we live in are trite, are banal, and sometimes even caustic. So what do you then do? The, the home then really becomes, for us, a critique of the picture window. Because there really no, there's nothing picturesque to see outside. Then it's really about figuring out how we can carve out this space or this volume, almost like an oasis, that will then make this, in a, in a certain way, uh, self-sufficient, uh, in a certain way, sustainable as an idea. And what we carve out has to be a space that is immersive. What we carve out also has to be added with a void, with maybe a garden, to then maybe have a three-dimensional frame that redefines your relationship with the silhouette of the sky. Almost like what a Richard Serra painting does. So if for Corbusier, the idea of facade making was a painterly one, a two-dimensional painterly rendition of what architecture can be, for us, it is an immersive, three-dimensional uh, 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 sort of